Hello, Revolution. Hey, so good to see you all. Glad you're here. Um, hey, if this is your first night especially, I just want to say welcome to you in particular. Um, here's what we do every single night. Uh, my name is John. I'm your student pastor, so I'm just a guy who gets to hang out with you every week. Uh, and we hang out in the lobby. We have some fun out there. You get to come in here. We're going to do some singing in just a little bit. We also like to have some fun. I, I tell you what's going on in the future. And uh, there's also a message just for you as high school students. So it talks about things that you're thinking about, wondering about. Uh, and then we head out into small groups. And small groups are really the best thing we do here. It's a group of people who you can ask questions to and, and make friends with and, and all those sort of things. So if you're new, you're not in a small group, it's really easy to get in one. And again, it's the best thing we do. So I, I really encourage you to do it. You just head out these doors. There's a table with some adults out there. They'll get you connected and then you're ready to go. So that's it. That's easy enough. Uh, but here's what we're going to do tonight. Usually we do something called a stage game at this point. We'd have some fun. Uh, tonight is going to look a little different. We're going to have extended worship. So we're taking out the game tonight. We're adding in a little extra worship. But we still got to do one shot, all right? We still got to do one shot because I want to give away some money. Uh, and so I need a volunteer. And while you're raising your hands, check out this video to see what one shot is all about. Okay, I pointed at a volunteer, but it may be their worst nightmare. They're, no, they're backing out. Okay, okay, no worries. Um, who, who wants to do it? Who's feeling one shot? Who's feeling one shot? Um, some people really want him to do it. Some people don't want him to. I'm here for the controversy of the crowd. Okay, fastest hand in the room. We're gonna go fastest hand in the room then. Come on up, Oscar. Come on up. Here's what happens every single week. Usually the winner of the stage game gets to take one shot. Tonight it's Oscar, just cause he's quick on the draw, but he, he gets to make this one shot. If he gets it, he gets a $15 gift card to Chick-fil-A. If it misses, goes up next week and we try again. It's Oscar. Oh, wow. So, honestly, so close. That was a great shot. Okay. Well, hey, well done, Oscar. Uh, <laughs> well done, Oscar. I, I appreciate your, your attempt. That was better than many of the shots we've seen this week, this month, this year. Um, okay. Hey, Revolution, two quick things for you. Again, we're not doing a game tonight. Um, we're about to enter into worship in a little bit, but the first is Rev Event is already up on the website. You can sign up for it now. And the first 100 people who sign up, you get a discount, uh, discounted price and you get a Rev T-shirt, a Rev Event T-shirt. And we do a really hard, like we work really hard to make sure the T-shirts are cool, something you'd actually want to wear. And there's only 100 of them. And there's like 78 people signed up right now. So if you want one of those shirts, if you want to be one of the people who signs up, Gets, a le gets it for less money, gets a shirt. You gotta like do it tonight because probably the other student pastors are telling their campus these things. Uh, but the Rev event, if you sign up now, you're saying, hey, I'm committing to it on my calendar. When my friends say, hey, what are you doing on the 21st? You're like, I've already got something on it. Or when your boss at work says, hey, can you work on the 21st? You say, nope, not, not gonna work for you. Whatever you say to your boss, I don't know. Say, say to your boss what you'll say to your boss, but don't go on the 21st because you're gonna be at Rev event, but sign up now. You're gonna get a t-shirt and you're essentially putting it on your calendar saying, this is a priority, I wanna be there and everything else is gonna get pushed off to the side so I can make it work. Uh, okay, and this is, this is uh, John with a pastoral encouragement for a second. Um, and I don't get to do these super often, but uh, just so you know, tonight we're talking about um, guilt and shame and, and the message you'll get to hear in a little bit. Um, but I just wanna read a verse from the Bible. It's, it's James 5.16. And James 5, 16 says, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Uh, and so what I want you to know is we confess our sins to God. And the word confess just means tell the truth. When you confess, you're just telling the truth. So we confess our sins to God to be forgiven and God can help heal us. But we confess our sins to each other, to other people, so that we can be healed. And so tonight, uh, if, you, if you are carrying something heavy, uh, if, if you have uh, something that is like, man, I'm, I'm really afraid to tell somebody about this. Like if you're, if you're struggling with a, an addiction to pornography, if you have thoughts about self-harm, if you are living a false life and you're telling people you're one person at, at church or at home and you're a different person elsewhere, uh, I want to just encourage you tonight. Like, can I, as someone who cares about you, can I encourage you to, to tell somebody tonight in your group? whether that's a leader or whether that's one of the other students, like Jesus asked this question to, to the man laying by the pool of Bethesda. Uh, he says, do you want to get well? This guy who had been sick his whole life. He says, do you want to get well? 
he asked that, that man that question. And so I want to ask you that same question tonight on behalf of Jesus. Like, do you want to get well? That heavy thing that you're carrying, uh, there is healing from it, but healing comes in confession and community. And so be bold tonight. It's scary. It's going to come at a cost. To share things that, that are, are hidden is always scary and it's hurtful and it's, it's like tough to bring it out to say like, man, can I trust people with this? Like, what are they going to think of me? Like, how is this going to go? Are my parents going to know? What's going to happen after this? All those thoughts are going to come up. But man, do you want to get well? Because I want you to get well and Jesus wants you to get well and there is healing. And so my encouragement tonight is community is the place you find that. Your small group, your small group leaders is the place that you find that tonight. And so be bold, even when it's really scary, even when you think, man, I don't know if I can trust this, but like, please be bold tonight because on the other side of that pain is healing and it's worth it, okay? Uh, hey, I, I just want to say too, as your pastor, uh, I really care about each, of, each one of you. Um, I don't know all of you. I wish I could. Uh, but as someone who doesn't even know you, like this is a place I've committed my life to. Like you are the people I've committed my life to. And so if you need at least a friend to talk to about this stuff, like I care about you unconditionally. No judgment for me. Um, like nothing, no, no uh, just feel free anytime to come talk to me. Ask, ask me to pray for you. I'd love to. I would listen to anything you want to tell me. Like, just know that. But you've got awesome small group leaders. You've got awesome people in your groups. Um, and on the other side of, of confession is healing. It's worth it. It's scary, but it's worth it. Uh, trust me. And so, okay, with that, Rev, that's my pastoral encouragement. I care about you guys a lot. Um, so if now, if you'll stand up for me, we're going to in, enter into a time of worship. Uh, and right now, we just get to worship the one uh, who does that healing, uh, Jesus, the person who uh, heals us and loves us. And so we're going to worship him for who he is and what he's done. And I'm going to turn it over to KJ and Madison. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, John. That was good. Good stuff. Hey, Rev, how are we doing tonight? These girls are so good. How is everybody else? Good? I'm not getting any answers, you guys. We're here together. It's going to be so fun. I need your participation. I need it. All right. We're going to spend some time singing together. Uh, this is KJ. You all know KJ. Everyone always asks me where KJ is. So you already know him. I don't need to introduce him. Um, my name is Madison. I don't know what's going on over here. Also, we want to welcome our friends watching over um, at YZ and Rochester and online. We love you guys. We wish you were here in the room with us. All right. This is all a really great place, a place to grow and to um, learn about Jesus more. But this is a place we can have fun too, all right? So can I get every hand in the air? Like this, come on. I know you guys can do that. Easy, easy peasy, come on, let's sing, here we go. Life. Only you can, only you can. Yeah. You 
Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand And everything around me is shaking I never He's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would he fail now? He won't He won't I've still got joy in chaos I've got peace that makes no sense so I won't be going nothing I'm not held by my own strength cause I feel my life on Jesus he's never let me down he's faithful in every season so
Yeah, 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 amen. Guys, Rev, this is so cool. So glad for these moments that we get to uh, sing together, we get to worship together. In these uh, moments that we create, you know, to do a little bit more of that together. I know um, some of you guys volunteer for GZ, and you go to a small group and you come back in here. Maybe some of you guys you show up on the weekends, you come with your family. Also, it's pretty cool. But in moments like these, this is, this is just for you. We, you know, come here and we carve out a night in the middle of the week because we believe that you're worth it. And this is a moment, this is a space, a time created just for all of you. And, you know, as we come down to the end of the school year, as our time is kind of winding down together thinking about, man, what's one thing I would really want our Rev students to take with them as we're winding down? And it's that there is one that's even more for you than any of us, any of your leaders, and it's Jesus. Jesus is the most for you person that you can ever meet, you can ever experience. And I believe there's a story in John chapter 8 that I think illustrates that perfectly. There is a woman who's caught in adultery, and some of the religious leaders of that time, they bring this woman to Jesus, look at her, you know, we caught her in the middle of sin, what do you have to say? And these guys are begging Jesus for an answer, he gets down, he starts writing something in the dirt, the Bible never specifies what he writes, but he's in the dirt, they're like, come on man, give us an answer, and Jesus stands up, you know, imagine he dusts himself off, he goes, yeah, yeah, for sure, um, let any of you without sin throw the first stone, go ahead, whichever one of you hasn't sinned. And they're all kind of proud. I'm, I'm imagining it's probably dead quiet in that moment because they're all like, well, I did one thing. But because they couldn't live up to that standard, they had to walk away. And so one by one, they're mad. They're just like frustrated. They walk away. So after they're all gone, Jesus looks around and says, is there anyone or any of your accusers left? It's like, no, they're all gone. And Jesus says, I don't accuse you either. And to me, that is the most perfect picture being for us because in that moment a couple things happen one he brings truth he tells her now go and sin no more stop doing what you're doing he brings truth to us that's a very big very important part that Jesus is Lord and he did die for all of our sins that is true but also in that moment Jesus was the only person that could have condemned her and he chose not to he showed her grace that is the picture of grace because of that, the kindness of our Savior is supposed to turn us toward him. So you will never experience someone that is more for you than that. We're going to keep singing. There's, this line, there's a line in this song, it's somewhere in the bridge, I'm trying to remember how it goes. My heart has been, uh, no, that's not it. I'm trying to remember exactly what line. I forgot it. We'll sing it, and I'll do, I'll like point to it. I'll be like, oh, this part when I remember it. Just look out for that. It'll be, you'll, you'll get it. But again, it's supposed to reinforce this idea. I want that to be your reminder, Rev, that as we close out this school year, as we keep going throughout your lives, and maybe you're gonna graduate from high school soon, wherever you go, maybe you're gonna move away and never come here again, and that's part of life. But I want you to always know and take with you that Jesus is always gonna be for you. Come on, say.
great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from the Thank you that you are for us. Jesus, when you are for us, nothing and no one can be against us. Jesus, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this place where we can come together. We can lift our voices. We can give you the praise that you are so worthy of, Jesus. And God, I pray 
for the rest of the night together. I pray for every moment that you would be in it. God, I pray that we would be in it. I pray that we would be present, that we would be um, available to you, Jesus. So God, would you open our hearts? Would you open our minds, Jesus? We love you. We love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen, Rev. Thanks for singing. Go ahead, take a seat. What's up, Revolution? My name is John, one of the pastors here. We are in week two of our series, The Me You Don't See. And if you missed it last week, make sure you go back and check out Daniel's message. It was incredible. But one of the things he talked about was, as people, we are body, spirit, and soul. Which means that so much of what makes us us is under the surface. It's hidden. And if we don't deal with the stuff that's hidden, we have big problems with mental health and our lives. So last week, he talked about grief and despair. Super happy topics. And tonight, we get to add to that. We get to do something else real happy, which is guilt and shame. Woo! Super awesome. I get it, though, right? I mean, how many of you guys, all right, show of hands, on your way into Rev tonight, you were like, man, I hope we get to talk about guilt and shame at church. That'd be amazing. One person. Thanks, buddy. We're going to have to talk after. That's a little bit messed up. But I get it. Like, when I got this topic, I wasn't so sure that I wanted to do this. I'd love to come out here and be like, let's talk about puppies and rainbows and happy stuff. But instead, tonight, it's guilt and shame. Because, again, I want you to raise your hands. Be honest. Have you ever felt guilty? Raise your hand. Have you ever felt guilty? You ever done something you're ashamed of? Said something you regret? If you don't have your hand up, you are lying. So we've all felt that. We all feel guilt and shame in our life. It's universal. And that's why we got to talk about it tonight. That's why we got to talk about it this week. Okay, so for me, this happened just this past week. I was at home. It's in the afternoon. I was all alone. I'm like, I'm all alone. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to McDonald's. Now, this might not seem like a big deal, but my wife hates McDonald's. She talks about cholesterol and heart disease, all these things I don't even think are true, but I love myself some McDonald's. And so there's nothing better at 2 p.m., then a quarter pound of with cheese, french fries, and a shake. That's my go-to afternoon snack. Now, I already had lunch, but I was, again, I was alone. I'm like, I know she doesn't want this, but I'm going to go to McDonald's. So I go to McDonald's. I bring it back. I enjoy it. It tastes amazing. But at the end, I got all the trash. I got the bag. And I'm like, what am I going to do with this? I don't want my wife to know. So I'm like, I'm not going to put it in the kitchen trash can. I'm going to go outside and put it in the outside trash can. So I put it out there. And I'm like, well, what if she opens up that thing? And so then I start covering with leaves and sticks and I cover it with other trash just to make sure that she does not know I went to McDonald's in the afternoon. I kid you not, that's what I did last week. Now, my wife is a Rev small group leader at Blaine. So she is seeing this right now. I just want to say I love you, babe. Sorry about that. We'll talk about that later. But, like, you ever done that? I mean, not with McDonald's, but did you ever hide your browser history? Did you ever erase some text messages? Did you ever lie about something? And then you lied again? to cover up that lie, because we've all dealt with this. Now, recent studies show that shame is the underlying condition for a ton of bad stuff. It's the number one underlying condition for addiction, for depression, for eating disorders, for emotional outbursts, for intrusive thoughts, these thoughts that get stuck in our mind, and suicidal ideation. So we need to talk about it, because we all feel guilt and shame in our lives. Now, the problem is we often use those words interchangeably. We're like guilt, shame, shame, guilt. They both mean the same thing, but they actually mean very different things. And it's important we know how different they are. So check this out. So when we do something wrong, we feel guilt. And what guilt does is goes, man, I did something bad. What shame does is I am bad. Because what guilt is focusing on, it's focusing on our behavior. But shame, 
It attacks our identity. So when you feel guilty, you're like, oh man, I lied. What shame wants to say is like, you're a liar. Like guilt is, oh man, I can't believe I cheated. And shame's like, you're a cheater. Guilt is, man, I made a mistake. I'm sorry I made a mistake. Shame is like, you're a mistake. So it takes what we did wrong and it makes it personal. But with guilt, because it focuses on behavior, it leads to some great stuff. It leads to repentance. It leads to be able to say, man, I'm sorry. That was my bad. It leads to changing your behavior. Man, I'm going to try to do better next time. I'll try not to say that again. I'll try not to do that again. It actually leads us to closer relationships. Like, there's a lot of good stuff that comes out of guilt. But shame, because it attacks our identity, it makes us want to withdraw from the world. And it leads to hiding and discouragement and isolation. So they're very different things. So when we think of them as the same thing, we want to avoid all of this. But we miss out on some of the great things that guilt provides. Because here's the truth I want you to know. Guilt is a gift. Guilt is a gift. You might not believe that, but it's true. And if we can lean into the gift of guilt, some great things can happen in our lives. But if we try to avoid it, then we miss all that great stuff. Because again, maybe you never thought about that that way. It's not the best gift. It's not the one we're super excited to open up. But often what happens with guilt is we run away from it. And then it turns into shame. But think of all that good stuff. Think about how it leads to repentance. Think of how it leads to closer relationships. Think of how it can lead to growing your life, to actually advancing in the world in some real ways. That's the gift of guilt. Now here's a picture of my son. I'm gonna show you him. That's Crosby. He's my youngest. You should say like, oh. Yeah, he's super cute. Look at that kid. He's got Legos. Look at that smile, those big, beautiful brown eyes. He's a great little kid most of the time. But sometimes, like just a few days ago when I came home and he was saying to his sister, I hate you. You're the worst sister. I wish you were never born. I don't even want you in this family. I'm like, this sweet boy is saying those things? So I get home. I know he said these things. And where is he? He's hiding. He's hiding in his room. Now, to his credit, he comes out. He comes out of his room, and he's got tears in his eyes. He's like, Dad, I'm so sorry. Like, I shouldn't have said those things. I was mad. I lost my temper. He gives me this big, huge hug. And, of course, I'm like, man, I forgive you, buddy. You need to go talk to your sister. <laughs> so he does that. Same thing, tears in his eyes. He's like, Sydney, I'm sorry. I'm like, do you forgive me? Like, they hug it out. And then they, like, go on the trampoline and have, like, have a ton of fun playing together. Because that's what happens so much. If we let guilt actually motivate us to repentance, if we actually see it as a gift, we actually engage in the world around us. Like, for my wife and I, when I mess up, which is a lot of times, like, when I am tender and honest with my wife, I'm like, man, babe, I am sorry. Like, that leads to closeness. That leads to some makeup, make out. Or whatever, you know, hey, I'm married, so it's fine for us. But it's amazing how that happens. Like you move forward in life. Like instead of becoming more isolated and hiding, if I embrace the guilt as a gift and I'm willing to take a step forward, like God uses that in some incredible ways. And the same is true for you. Shame, man, shame is a different story. So that's why we have to see them as different. Because shame, it can sometimes start as guilt, but this is what the deal is with shame. Shame destroys us. Shame destroys us. Shame takes guilt, something we feel bad about. Maybe you said something you regret, but you didn't bring it to God. You didn't ask for forgiveness. You started to avoid it, and it quickly gets distorted into shame. And remember, shame makes it personal, and it doesn't stop. That's why shame destroys us. That's why it's so bad, because it keeps dragging us down. I was a swimmer in college. I know that's hard to believe, but I was a swimmer in college. And one of the drills that we did is we would go to the deep end of the pool and we would start treading water. And then we would have to hold a 25 pound weight over our heads as we were treading water. So you couldn't use your arms. It was a way to work on your kicks. So you're in the deep end of the pool, coach starts a timer and you're treading water with your legs, holding this 25 pound weight and you're lasting as long as you can because you want to win. You want those other people to, to sink before you do. So you're doing that, but you have to get tired with that weight and you're starting to like breathe out of the corner of your mouth as long as you can. And then whenever you have to, you just chuck the weight down, swim to the side and catch your breath. So that's like shame except worse. Because what shame does, like you're treading water, 
you feel bad about something you did, and then shame just keeps piling on more and more weight. Shame, bad feelings, avoidance, more shame, more bad feelings, more avoidance, more shame, and you drown. Shame wants to drown you every time. You ever felt that? You messed up? You didn't own it? You just kind of hid it, hoping it would go away, but it gnaws at you. It makes you feel stuck. It makes you feel alone. That's shame. That's what shame does. And what sucks about shame is that sometimes it starts as guilt. Sometimes it starts because we did something wrong. We don't deal with guilt as a gift, so it starts to turn into shame in our life. But sometimes we can feel shame because of what someone else says about us. We can feel shame about what someone else does to us. It actually has nothing to do with us. We're a total victim to someone else's thing, but we start to feel shame, and it begins to take root in our lives. All right, here's a picture of me. Look at that kid. That's me in elementary school. You should also be like, oh, what a cute kid. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the four of you that did that. But here's the deal. Like, when I was a little kid, like, I was the smallest kid in my class. Like, I didn't hit a growth spurt till about senior year of high school. So all through elementary school, all through middle school, I was always known as Little John. Like, oh, Little John, he's so small. I'm always in the front row of the pictures. Like, I hated it. And then here's the deal with the glasses. Like, I was raised in a time where people would be like, four eyes, you got glasses, you're four eyes. And it would just bother me so much. But here's the deal. I'm wearing glasses because I have a cross eye. So if I don't wear my glasses, then my eyes are all crossed. So either way, I'm going to get made fun of. It's brutal. Now, my wife likes my googly eye, so I'm pretty cool with that. But that's why I got glasses. So growing up, it's like it was, I was being made fun of for wearing glasses. I was being made fun of for being small and short for so long that I was so ashamed of the way I looked. Like, I genuinely hated the way I looked. Like, I didn't want to be little and cute. I wanted to be big and strong. I wanted to be in the back row of the picture. And so I felt so much shame about what I looked like. And then maybe at some point in your life, people have said stuff about you. Maybe they've said, you're too fat, or you're too skinny, or you're too weak, or you're not smart enough, you're too loud, you're too quiet, you're too happy, you're not happy enough, you're not fast enough, strong enough, good enough. And to no fault of your own, you started to feel ashamed of who you are. Like, maybe you felt embarrassed about what you look like, about what you act like. Maybe you're embarrassed about how you think, how you feel. Like, you're trying to change who you are. Maybe even right now, you start to dress different. You start to eat different. You start to hide your real personality. You're ashamed of your interests, your passions, all because of criticism from other people. That's why shame is so nasty. It's why it's so destructive. Because none of that's your fault at all. And yet what shame takes root, it convinces us we're alone. It convinces us that we have no value. Now some of you tonight, you've been carrying shame for far too long. you become an expert at hiding and pretending. You didn't let guilt draw you to repentance. You're just pretending everything's fine. Maybe pretending that you're perfect, no big deal. And it's killing you. Man, there's been times in my life where I couldn't imagine a way out. Shame was drowning me. But I want to make sure that you know tonight that there's a way forward. Like, there is a way to destroy the power of shame in our lives. Victory is possible. But how? How do we experience victory? I think we see hope for a way forward, a life free from shame. And one of my favorite stories in the Bible comes from John chapter 5. Jesus is walking to Jerusalem. And there's this area in Jerusalem where there's this like mineral spring, hot spring pool. And there's this sort of superstition that if the angels fly over the water at just the right time, the water bubbles up. Like, and you get in the water, you'll experience some healing. So there's this huge community of sick people just laying around the pool, hoping to get in the water at just the right time to experience some healing. So Jesus enters the scene. Check this out. So one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for that long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? I can't, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. 
That dude has been there for 38 years. That's twice as long as any of you have been alive. And never, not one time, got into the pool at the right time. Think of that. Think of how embarrassing that that would be. 38 years with no friend. Think of the shame he must have felt. 38 years, no one can help that dude out. So I love that Jesus enters that scene and finds that guy. He goes straight up to him. And remember what he says. Would you like to get well? Now, if I was that guy, I'd be like, yeah, Jesus, 38 years, bro. Like, yeah, I want to get well. Like, what do you think? Let's do this thing. But again, check his response. I can't. I have no one. Not yes. Not thank you. Not, yeah, let's do this thing. It's just, I can't. And that's the power of shame. Like, even when healing is right in front of them, you just go, I can't. I have no one. And for all of us, shame keeps us on that mat. Now, I used to read this story. And I, I, I saw that guy's response. And I'd be like, dude, Jesus is right in front of you, man. Like, what a dumb excuse. Like, you can't? Like, what's that all about? But the more I've read this story, the more I've come to realize that this guy, he actually gives the perfect response. Because he's finally being brutally honest. Like, and that's the key to this story. He doesn't know who Jesus is. Like, he isn't aware of what could be, but he doesn't hide his shame. He doesn't pretend he's gonna be fine. He doesn't tell Jesus, like, I'll get there someday, I'm sure. Like, he finally admits the truth out loud. I can't. And that's when Jesus steps in. When that dude is honest and is just like, I can't carry this anymore, that's when Jesus steps in and does what only Jesus can do. Check this out. Jesus told him, get up. Pick up your mat and walk. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up his mat and began walking. Boom! Let's go, Jesus! I mean, that is big time. Can you imagine that? 38 years. 38 years of shame. 38 years of being the guy with no one. 38 years of darkness. 38 years of no hope. 38 years of waiting. And Jesus walks into that thing and says, get up. And the good news for you is Jesus is still in the business of telling people to get up. He's still in the business of changing lives. And he's asking each and every one of you, do you want to get well? Like right now tonight, do you want to get well? So my wife and I, we've been married 20 years. And right before we got married, she was starting to complain about a pain in her foot. It's about six months, a few months before we got married. And so as we got closer to the wedding, it was like, and then she started to have a little limp. As we got really close to the wedding, it was like she was like wincing in pain with every step that she took. I'm like, babe, I don't want you walking down the aisle crying and wincing in pain. People are going to think the wrong thing about a relationship. So, like, let's get this taken care of. So she finally makes a point with the doctor. Now, my wife is terrified of doctors. Terrified of McDonald's and terrified of doctors. But I make her appointment. She goes there. We sit in this office. And this old, sweet doctor walked into the room He's like checking out her foot, and she's like, hey, did you happen to step on anything recently? And she's like, man, you know, maybe about six months ago, you know, I broke a, a piece of glass. I, I think I might have stepped on that. She, he's like, I bet that's what it is. And he's like feeling the foot. She's like, you know what? You probably have a piece of glass in there, a little, a little mass formed over it, and it's causing a lot of pain. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to do a little incision. We're going to take that mass out. We're going to take that piece of glass out. You're going to be on your way. No problem. My wife's like, excuse me? You're going to do what? He's like, oh, don't worry about it. Small incision, take care of it, you'll be fine. She's like, nope, nope, I'm gonna do it myself. And like, the doctor's eyes get huge. She's like, you're what? Like you're, and he goes, you're gonna cut your foot open, you're gonna remove a mass, then remove a piece of glass, then sew your foot back up. My wife's like, yep, yep, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. And she left the room. And so I am sitting there staring at old man doctor like, I don't know, I don't know I'm about to marry this woman, I'm not sure what to do. So I spurt down, it is, guys, it's just like a movie. Like, my wife is pressing the door close button on the elevator, like, to get out of there, and I, like, I put my hand in, I stop the door, and I'm like, babe, like, just to be clear, you're gonna cut your foot open, remove stuff out of it, sew it back up, like, that's your plan? And she's like, probably not. I was like, let's go back to the doctor. So we go back to the doctor. Doctor does the procedure in, like, five minutes. And, like, perfectly healed, no problem at all. Like healing was right there in front of her, right? But she wasn't willing to admit that she couldn't do it on her own. 
It was only when she was willing to be like, I can't. Like, I actually can't do this on my own. That's when healing came for her. So are you willing to be honest with God? Are you willing to admit, I can't? Like, shame wants to keep you hiding. Shame wants us to say, I'll be fine. Like, but if you want to be free from shame, you need to be honest with God. You need to get to a place of saying, I can't deal with this on my own. Because here's the deal. What's hidden can't be healed. What's hidden can't be healed. It's only when we're honest with ourselves, when we're honest with God about all the dark places where shame lives in our lives, that's when his light can break through. That's when we can start to experience healing. Because let's be real. We're all hiding something. I'm hiding stuff, you're hiding stuff. Right? There's things that we haven't been honest with about God to God, or there's things we haven't been honest with to our friends. But Reb, Jesus is here tonight. I believe it. And he wants you to stop hiding. He wants to provide healing. He wants you to get up off that mat of shame and walk. Now, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy to be honest. Like maybe the shame you're carrying, maybe it's around the way you feel about your body, the way you look. Maybe you're carrying shame right now because you know that you're cutting yourself. You're dealing with self-harm. Maybe you're carrying shame around pornography. I mean, man, that's a big one. Like, I'm gonna be honest, that was, that was a big one for me coming out of college. Like, I was stuck, and I was so ashamed. I was convinced that I was alone. I was afraid to tell anyone. I pretended for a while, like, ah, it's no big deal. But the truth is, I was hiding. And I had great Christian friends. I had so many chances in college and afterwards to be honest, to share, but I didn't. I was so embarrassed. And here's the deal, being a Christian, it actually doesn't make it easier to deal with shame. I actually think it makes it tougher because I wanted to keep up my image as like the good Christian guy who would never struggle with stuff like that. And it wasn't until I finally had the courage to be honest with God, to be like, God, I can't. Like, I can't handle this on my own. I can't deal with this on my own. When I was honest with my friends, when I was honest with my pastor, like that's when breakthrough started to happen in my life. Maybe for some of you, you're medicating your shame right now. You're medicating it with drinking, with smoking pot, with hooking up, with cheating, with lying. You know you're pretending to be someone that you aren't. And maybe you can't imagine that God could handle what you need to share with him. But he can. He comes through every time. But shame wants to keep you paralyzed on that mat. But remember, Jesus tells that guy to get up. And he's saying the same thing to you. He's saying the same thing to you. He wants you to experience the miracle of new life. What's incredible about that story is that when Jesus tells that guy to get up, that's the same word that's used to describe Easter morning when they talk about Jesus getting up out of that grave. So what Jesus is saying to that guy is so much more than just physically get up and walk. He's telling that guy to experience new life, to experience what it means to go from death to life, to experience freedom for the first time, from darkness to light. That's what Jesus is saying to that guy, and that's what Jesus is saying to you. So tonight, Rev, I want you to take two steps of faith to break the power of shame in your life, to get off that mat. First thing, tell God, I can't. Be honest with him. Stop pretending that, God, I can't handle this addiction. God, I, I can't deal with these feelings. God, I can't, I can't keep hiding anymore. Like, trust him. He can handle whatever you throw at him. Be honest with him and start to experience the healing that only he gives. Second thing is, tell someone you trust. Like, go to God first but then go to someone you trust. Not everybody can handle this. Don't go to everybody, don't post this on something. Just go to someone you trust. Maybe your small group leader, maybe student pastor, maybe a wise, trustworthy friend. Stop the isolation. Remember, what's hidden can't be healed. So you gotta have some courage. You gotta be willing to share. You gotta be willing to go there with God and with the people that you trust. Rev, some of you tonight, I believe you're gonna hear from Jesus 
get up. Stop hiding. So let Jesus destroy the power of shame in your life. Experience that power of Easter morning. New life, walking in freedom, stepping forward, getting out of darkness into light. I believe that this night could change your life. This night could be the night that you break free from shame. So get up off that mat and walk out of this place a different person. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you sent your son Jesus and he defeated sin and death. He defeated the power and grip of shame so that we can experience freedom and life. So Lord Jesus, for every single one of us that are hiding, God, give us the courage to be honest with you. Give us the courage to be willing to say, God, I just can't anymore. And Lord, we hear from you, even right now in this moment, get up. Get up and experience new life. God, we want to experience that from you. We trust you for that. We love you. We thank you. Amen. All right, thanks a lot, Rev. Have a great night. See ya.